Zadie Smith, uh, at this point, and I'm sure, um, well, so this is just a prop. Uh, uh, truly, to this audience, needs no introduction, but uh, given the presumption that all of you are rabid Zadie Smith fans, um, I'm going to ask her to read, um, not from White Teeth, her stunning first book, not from Autograph Man, her second novel, but from On Beauty, the latest in its very fat British edition, Zadie Smith. Hi, um, I'm going to, I've never read this bit before, I don't know what it's going to be like. Um, it's, it's about Kiki, who's uh, one of the main characters of the book, who's married to an academic, but isn't an academic herself. So it's, I guess it's kind of about the feeling of being in a milieu which isn't quite your own, um, in your own house. So here we go. Uh, by the time Kiki returned to 83 Langham, her first guest had arrived. It's an unnatural law of such parties that the person whose position on the guest list was originally the least secure is always the first to arrive. <laughs> Christian von Klepper's invitation had been added by Howard removed by Kiki, reinstated by Howard, removed by Kiki, and then at some later point, apparently extended once more in secret by Howard. <laughs> For here was Christian, leaning into an alcove in the living room, nodding devotedly at his host. From where she stood in the kitchen, Kiki could see only a sliver of both men, but he didn't need to see much to get the picture. She watched them unnoticed as she took off her cardigan and hung it over a chair. Howard was full of beans, hands in his hair, leaning forward. He was listening, but really listening. It's amazing, thought Kiki, how attentive he can be when he puts his mind to it. In his efforts to make peace with her, Howard had spent months showering some of this attention on Kiki herself, and she knew all about the warmth it afforded, the flattering bliss of it. Christian, under its influence, looked properly young for once. You could see him permitting himself some partial release from the brittle persona that a visiting lecturer of only 28 must assume if he has ambitions of becoming an assistant professor. Well, good for him. Kiki took a lighter from a kitchen drawer and began to kindle her tea lights wherever she found them. This should have all been done already. The quiches hadn't been heated. Where were the children? An appreciative rumble of Howard's laughter reached her, and now he and the boy swapped roles. Now it was Howard doing the talking, and Christian following every syllable like a pilgrim. The younger man looked modestly to the floor in response, Kiki assumed, to some piece of flattery of her husband's. Howard was more than generous that way. If flattered, he repaid the favour tenfold. And when Christian's face resurfaced, Kiki saw it was flushed with pleasure, and a second later this shaded into something more calculated. The recognition, maybe, that the compliment was nothing less than his due. Kiki went to the fridge and took out a very good bottle of champagne. She picked up a plate of Bang Bang chicken canapes. She hoped these would serve as replacement for any opening bon mots she might be expected to come up with. She couldn't remember when she felt less like having a party than at this moment. Sometimes you get a flash of what you look like to other people. This one was unpleasant. A black woman in a head wrap, approaching with a bottle in one hand and a plate of food in the other, like a maid in an old movie. The real staff, Monique and an unnamed friend of hers who was meant to be handing out drinks, were nowhere to be seen. <laughs> The living room revealed only one other person, Meredith, fat and pretty Japanese-American girl, constant, you assume platonic, companion of Christian. She had an extraordinary outfit on in her back to the room, engrossed in reading the spines of Howard's art books on the opposite wall. Kiki was reminded that although Howard's fan club within the university was extremely small, it had an intensity in inverse proportion to its size. Because of the stringencies of his theories and his dislike of his colleagues, Howard was nowhere near as successful or as popular or as well-paid as his peers in Wellington. He had instead a miniature campus cult. Christian was the preacher, Meredith was the congregation. If there were others, Kiki had never met them. There was Smith J. Miller, Howard's teaching assistant, a sweet-tempered white boy from the Deep South, but Smith was paid for his services by Wellington. Kiki opened the living room door wide with her heel, wondering again where Monique, who might have thought to wedge the thing open, was hiding. Christian didn't yet turn to acknowledge her, but he was already pretending to like Murdoch, which is their dog, playing around his ankles. He leaned forward with the clumsy loom of the natural pet hater and child fearer, all the time clearly hoping for an intervention before he reached the dog. His elongated, lean body struck Kiki as a comic, human version of Murdoch's own. He bothering you? Oh, no, Mrs. Belsey, hello. No, not at all. Not really. 
If anything, I was concerned that he might choke on my laces. <laughs> really? said Kiki, looking down dubiously. No, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Christian's features abruptly morphed into his pinched attempt at a party face. And anyway, happy anniversary. It's so amazing. Well, thank you for so much for coming. My God, said Christian, with that clipped, puzzlingly European inflection he had. He'd been raised in Iowa. I'm simply privileged to be invited. It must be a very special occasion for you. What a milestone. Kiki sensed that he hadn't said any of this to Howard, and indeed Howard's eyebrows now raised a little as if he'd not heard Christian speak like this before. The banalities, obviously, were safe for Kiki. Yeah, I guess. It's just a nice thing, beginning of semester and everything. Shall I get the dog away from you? Christian had been stepping from side to side, trying to lose Murdoch, but instead offering him the kind of challenge he adored. <laughs> oh, well, I don't want to. No trouble, Christian. Don't sweat it. Kiki nudged Murdoch off with her toe and then gave him another nudge to direct him out of the room. God forbid Christian should get any dog hairs on those fine Italian shoes. No, that was unfair. Christian slicked down his hair with his palm along that se severe parting on the left side of his head, a line so straight it seemed marked out with a ruler, and that too was unfair. Well, I got me champagne in one hand and chicken in the other, said Kiki, excessively jolly as penance for her thoughts. What can I do you for? Oh God, said Christian. He seemed to know a joke should go here, but he was constitutionally unable to provide one. Choices, choices. Give them here, darling, said Howard, taking only the champagne from his wife. Proper hellos at first might be nice. You know Meredith, don't you? Meredith, if one were to remember two facts about each of one's guests in order to introduce them to other guests, was interested in Foucault and costume wear. At various parties, Kiki had listened carefully and yet not understood what Meredith was saying while Meredith was dressed as an English punk, a fin de siècle dame in a drop-waisted Edwardian gown, a French movie star, and most memorably a 40s war bride, her hair set and curled like Bacall's complete with stockings and stays and that compelling black line curving up the back of both her mighty calves. <laughs> this evening, Meredith's dress was a concoction of pink chiffon, with a wide circle skirt you had to make space for, and a little black mohair cardigan slung over her shoulders. This last was set off by a gigantic diamante brooch. Her shoes were peaked toe red heels that put at least a three inch distance between Meredith and her real height as she strode across the room. She stretched out a white kid glove for her host hostess to shake. Meredith was 27 years old. Of course, wow, Meredith, said Kiki, blinking theatrically. Honey, I don't even know what to say. I should have some kind of award for best party outfit. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you look fine, girl. Uh. Kiki whistled, and Meredith, who was still holding one of Kiki's hands, took the opportunity to do a twirl, holding Kiki's hand high and describing a small circle beneath it. You like? I would so very much like to tell you I just threw it together, said Meredith loudly and quickly in her nervous Californian scream. But it takes me a long, long time to look this good. Bridges have been built quicker. Whole hermeneutic systems have coalesced with more speed. Just from here to here, said Meredith, that's like three hours. <laughs> the bell rang. Howard groaned as if the present company were more than enough, but went practically skipping off to answer it. Abandoned by their only real connection, the little triangle fell quiet, resorting to smiles. Kiki wondered precisely how far she was from Meredith and Christian's ideal of a leader's appropriate consort. We made you a thing, said Meredith abruptly. Did he tell you we made you this thing? Maybe it's crap, I don't know. No, no, I hadn't yet, said Christian, blushing. Like a thing, a present, is that corny? 30 years and all that, have you just been corny? I'll just, said Christian, crouching down awkwardly to get his old fashioned satchel. So we did some half-assed research and it turns out that 30 year anniversary is pearl. But as you know, the average grad income doesn't really stretch that far, so we weren't really in the pearl way of things. <laughs> Meredith laughed manically. And then Chris thought of this poem, and then I did my arts and craft thing, and anyway, here it is. See, it's like a framed, fabric -y type poem thing. I don't know. <laughs> Kiki felt the warm teak frame delivered into her hands and admired the crushed rose petals and the broken shells under the glass. The text was sewn in, like a tapestry. It was the most unusual present she could have expected from these two. It was lovely. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones of coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes, read Kiki, circumspectly, aware that she should know it. So that's the pearl thing, said Meredith. It's probably stupid. <laughs> oh, no, it's gorgeous, said Kiki, skim reading the rest of herself in a quick whisper. Is it plath? That's wrong, isn't it? It's Shakespeare, said Christian, <laughs> wincing slightly. <laughs> the Tempest. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange 
Plath stripped it for parts. Shit, Kiki laughed. When in doubt, say Shakespeare, and when in sports, say Michael Jordan. <laughs> that is totally my policy, agreed Meredith. Well, this is really gorgeous. How will love it? I don't think it comes under his representational art ban. No, it's, it's textual, said Christian, testily. That's the point, it's a textual artifact. Kiki looked at him inquiringly. She wondered sometimes whether Christian was in love with her husband. Where is Howard, said Kiki, revolving her head absurdly around the empty room. He'll just love this. He loves to hear that nothing on him doth fade. <laughs> Meredith laughed again. Howard re-entered the room with a clap of his hands. Thanks. Among the other uh, wonderments of that sh short passage is not only that you read in uh, Americanisms very convincingly and beautifully, but more than your year at uh, in Cambridge Mass, uh, uh, did the your ability to write highly American dialogue for Kiki and Meredith and Christian, for instance, um, come from what? I mean, it's not. It, there are lots of problems. Like there are acts like Kiki's meant to be from Florida, and there's lots of mistakes in terms of her accent and the way she speaks. And uh, I, when I start, I try not to be really fearful, because if you're really terrified about accuracy, particularly cultural accuracy, you just, personally for me, I would be paralyzed. So I try not to think about authenticity in that sake. And so obviously you, you lose things by doing that. I and mean, then you lose readers, I'm sure, who are just insulted by it. Um, but maybe from taking a bit of a risk, an imaginative risk, you, you get to gain a few things too. That's how I kind of, I try to think of it. You also mentioned in that piece, movies twice, uh, Old movies, old 40s movies, and I, in my in my days of research on every aspect of your life for this uh, program, I, I read that you are a big fan, were a big fan, obsessive fan as a child of MGM musicals, and and that you wanted to be at some point a tap dancer. Um, yeah, I, I, I part of the thing about the 30s and 40s movies, I'm just very. I think, uh, I think people who know me would say a very unvisual person, and that's quite clear sometimes from the novels too, and I like things which are very wordy. Um, and I'm, I, with a lot of contemporary cinema, I'm just a bit, I'm a bit lost, I think. I, I can't understand scripts with only 25 words in them and excessive music. And, and I, this, some of my favorite films, something like The Philadelphia Story, which I actually once saw in Bright Park, it's a lovely experience, um, are incredibly artificial constructions. I mean, they're, they creak, you know, like plays when you see them filmed. And I, I don't know why, but I've, I've always preferred that kind of thing. Extreme artificiality on film. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We were talking about artificiality and uh, before, and, and certain novelists who do a certain kind of stylization really successfully. Obviously, what you do, what you have done thus far, is, uh, is realism and naturalism with extraordinary success. Well, I... Well, the realism, I mean, for me it's an indulgence, particularly in this book, because it, if you ask me if I had a critic's hat on or if I was thinking seriously about it and talking seriously, uh, the kind of realism I write is not something I, I would get, I wouldn't run on that ticket, you see what I mean? I wouldn't uh, defend it and I wouldn't argue for it. Uh, and that's, that's a strange thing I, I find in my writing. I know a lot of writers do will run on the ticket they write for and will argue for it and make a case for it. And thus far, I, I wouldn't say that was true of me. And, you know, I feel, you know, it's a strange thing. You have a Duchamp, your idol, but people will continue to paint those tulips. And, and the same is true of fiction. But I suppose I, though I, I love to write that way, and this book was a great indulgence for me and a joy to write, I, it's not something, I would have a hard time defending the practice of writing 19th century fiction. Well, so <laughs> you, you approve of more conventionally uh, unrealistic, modernist 20th no, century fiction? No, 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 no. I just, more? I, I, what I really admire, um, I, I was saying to Kurt before we came out, I'm writing a long essay on David Foster Wallace at the moment, and uh, uh, what I wanted to call it, there's a line in one of his stories which says, uh, describes someone breaking the rhythm that excludes thinking. And that's what I really admire in fiction. People are able to do that. You know, the, the rhythm I write in is, is pleasurable because it's familiar. Um, and I hope within that I do things which are maybe less familiar or a bit more interesting or at least entertaining to me. But uh, 
Uh, I suppose that, yeah, that is what I admire most. People are able to do that. And should we assume that the Zadie Smith novels that we'll be reading in 10 years or 20 years will be more like David Foster Wallace or Kafka <laughs> about <laughs> that, Newton Britain? That's extremely unlikely, I can tell you that, um, <laughs> just from ability. Um, no, it, you know, it's not... Wallace is an extreme example because he, you could say he, he looks modern and he smells modern, and so people are kind of terrified, not him literally, obviously, <laughs> his books. Um, but there are a lot of ways to... Um, I mean, Kurtz is a very good example of something which may lull you into a certain familiarity, but isn't at all what I would call classical realism. Kurtz Uh huh. Um, so there's a lot of ways to skin the cat, um, and I, I haven't completely given up on on the idea of realism. But you have to define what realism is. If it just means books which kind of sound like movies, or where you kind of feel that you could move through the book as a, a person through a real environment, I, I that's not a very effective description. That's maybe a bit lazy. But I, I, I mean, I do hope. The, 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 what it is, uh, there's a really great quote I used once in an essay. I think it's Mary McCarthy talking about Lillian Helmy. said everything she ever said is a lie, including and and the. So when you write, you want to move away from, that's the worst possible conception. And then as you write, you hope for something as close to the truth that, as you conceive it as possible. So it's not that I would like to write books that are accurate to somebody else's idea of, of a true world, but you want to at least be accurate to your conception. And it would be strange if... A certain straight kind of 19th century realism was your conception, wouldn't it, given that you're living in quite a different time and world? And maybe uh, uh, move them in different ways as well. I think when I was younger, you go to other people's readings and everybody's, you know, like a 26 year old hipster, and you think, where are my 26 year old hipsters? What happened to that? And then I realised that my audience was varied in a way that was really exciting for me. Presumably, as a function of the fact that the characters in your books are so varied, almost to a, perhaps to a fault, and, and, and certainly you are generous to all kinds of people. You don't privilege the 26-year-old hipster over the yeah. old person or the white person over the black person or any of the rest. Well, the, you hit upon something which I didn't really realize about readers, because I've been in an academic environment so, for so long and I hadn't been reading contemporary fiction, that people do read for character in that way and really do align themselves. So, you know, young women buy books by young women about young women. And, uh, but I, I'd been completely out of that loop. I just wasn't reading contemporary You books. escaped the academy just in time. <laughs> yeah, uh. that, was, that passed me by. So that's, you're completely right, that's what is going on. And I, when I first read White Teeth, it was quite common. So uh, I'd be at the table and a, an Indian woman in her early 30s would say, I really like Alsana. And then an old man would say, I really like Archie. And then a young woman would say, I really like Zora. Think, oh, okay. But I, I would quite like, I guess one of the purposes of the, of the stories that I tell is to force people to empathize a bit further away from themselves than, than what seems similar. Howard, uh, who is the, the figure in, in, the, in On Beauty who has this clack of two people at that party, uh, is, is this white butcher's son who's now this very hoity-toity art professor in America, his, his, his son with Kiki is this half-black American who grew up in a college environment, but who plays at being a tough ghetto kid. You play both of those cases of self-reinvention as they are, ironic and interesting and funny. Um, in real life, do you find that that kind of self-reinvention is a good thing, that the ability, the fluidity that permits that in, in, in society and culture? It, it depends. Like for me, it was a necessity. I, uh, recent, I was recently um, talking to a, a woman called Gabby Wood, a really good writer and journalist, and her father is an academic. And over lunch, I, I was kind of I couldn't hide my uh, kind of amazement at the idea of having a father who was an academic who then, when you gave him your work, would understand it entirely. And so she, she didn't need to to change because the person what she was making was understandable by the, by the people she came from. So, uh, for me, I, I, I suppose my own reinvention came from going to Cambridge and having this life which maybe wasn't really uh, predestined for me. But for people who were born slightly outside all of that, it's not a, you have no choice but to reinvent yourself, otherwise you're not really going anywhere. So, but, but the other thing about that is there's a, there's a kind of sadness connected with it. And I, I think particularly um, the scene in the book with Howard and his father, I, I knew quite a lot of people like that in college, a generation um, above me, the people who were teaching me, who were working class English boys, who were now, you know, incredible theorists, professors of all stripes, 
uh, who live a completely different life. And, and this other thing about them, that they were from the north or that they had uh, very humble families, it, it's kind of disappeared. And I always thought that was a, a strange sadness, that if you are from anywhere outside, you have to let go of your life, whereas if you're slightly more entitled, you bring it all with you, which is, I, I imagine, so much more pleasurable. Is, has your sense been to the group living in America a bit and, and visiting America a bit that, as we like to think, we Americans, that that's an easier transaction for us than in Britain? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I can only talk from my own experience. And of course, the, the key difference to me in the academic environment is that my education was free from the day it began till it, the day it ended. And it would have been impossible under any other circumstance. Whereas my experience in American universities is that the, the kids have a lot of money, um, apart from some exceptions. So it you were at Harvard. I was at Harvard, obviously. Yeah. But, um, but Cambridge you know, sh is, should be thought of as the equivalent, the academic equivalent of that place. And, and there, it seemed to me that there was more opportunity. Otherwise, I would never would have been there. Other than changing your name from Sadie to Zadie a, a little more than half your life ago, mm -hmm. uh, are there other instances of, of explicit self-reinvention? that you'll admit? Um, well, but the, the reason for that is, is so often I, I keep on reading it and it's completely untrue. I was in love with a boy whose name began with Z and I thought at 14 that somehow I could help the situation <laughs> by joining him at the other end of the alphabet. Um, but now I'm very, very glad about it because it, it, it's, it works kind of as a, a name for the books which is slightly separate from the name I have for myself in my head, which is my real name with really? it, I think. So, so Zadie Smith is a character, a brand. It's become that. It's become yeah. something which is on a book. I don't think of myself that way all the time. You've said, uh, or you were quoted to say in an interview, I'm a little paranoid that whatever I do is in danger of being destroyed by the person I'm becoming. What does that mean? Jesus. That must have been a bad book tour day. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I suppose I'm, I have quite a Protestant mentality, maybe. Uh, my husband is a Protestant. I've, I've no religion. I feel like a Protestant in that I am very suspicious of things that take you away from your work. And I would imagine that was a book tour comment. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I didn't... It's the honest truth, it seems so long away now, but when I first started writing, I didn't know that there was all this thing around books, because I just thought people wrote books and that was the end of the story, and they came out. I didn't know there was all the other stuff. And the other stuff is, you know, I don't mean to sound strange, but I think it is personally corrupting, honestly. So, so we're witnessing some corruption. You're right witnessing here, right? some corruption <laughs> as we speak. Um, do, do you worry, given that you're prone to Protestant worry, um, do you worry that uh, having spent all of your working life, your adult life, in a darkened room, I understand, um, alone, making up stories, that by not being out in the world in other ways, um, that you will come to the end of your well of material and experience and... Well, you know, I never, uh, as an adolescent, I never believed in experience. When my friends went to India, I just thought it was, all that stuff was totally irrelevant, travel or relationships or even friendships, you know, I didn't, I thought all you needed was to read other people's books and then this would, this would make you a writer. And that is the kind of writer I think I was, definitely. White Teeth is very much a product of, of reading a lot of fiction and kind of putting it through some fiction blender and out comes White Teeth. But um, the, the, the older I get, I absolutely believe in experience now and that it is um, transforming and, and it's the central test of your life. It's very easy to sit and read and make all these little moral decisions of what happens in Pride and Prejudice or what happens in Vanity Fair, but this is nothing like moving through the world, being married, having friends, dealing with humans. So no, I take it much more seriously now. Um, another um, thing you've been quoted as saying, and it doesn't sound so much like a bad uh, book tour quote, you say, I always find an absurdity in people's most strongly held cultural views and what I take to be the corollary, I'm almost entirely ambivalent most of the time. I think uh, my husband always has a go at me for my ambivalence, and he's, he's not ambivalent, but I, that, uh, there's a great phrase that Forster used to describe a character, I think it's Harriet Harrison maybe, that uh, she was um, full of consistency and moral enthusiasm, and he doesn't mean it as a compliment. And uh, I, always, I do think of English fiction as having a deep horror 
of people who are both consistent and morally enthusiastic. Those are the worst type of people you can never come across. Um, but, but then again, uh, and this is again from reading Foster Wallace recently, it's a very easy default position to be uh, the cynic, or what used to be called the postmodern cynic, from the, the, and have some fear of people who have this kind of moral enthusiasm. But the bottom line is, uh, you have to find something, he puts it as you have to find something to worship, and you have to live by it. These are kind of very strict Aristotelian ideas, but I, I think it's, it's true. Uh, but I, I do have a horror of party politics. Uh, I, my husband's here, so I'm very conscious of him being here and, and listening to me. Uh, but he would say it just because I can't bear to read those sections of the paper, and I'm sure he's right. But I, I, I can't... I can't bear the idea that once you pick your side, you follow it all the way through against all common sense, against everything that is um, before your own eyes as evidence. The global warming issue is a, is a good one at the moment. It's extraordinary to hear people arguing political angles on this incredible inevitability facing them down. So that, that kind of terrifies me. Although that's a good case in point of where uh, one could ease, one, one, it seems to me, ought not to be ambivalent. Right? No, absolutely. Um, but I, I suppose I'm ambivalent about political positions. I, I can't... You, I find it hard enough to say, you know, here is a man, or here am I as, as a person without deciding exactly what my colour is, no matter what argument you put in front of me. I, does I, does I, that ambivalence, do you think, lead toward your exquisite moments of comedy in your books, or vice versa? Or are you just a comically inclined person and that makes you... Uh, feeds your ambivalence? I think, you know, I don't think of myself as a funny person, but I think I do. Uh, uh, one quality I, ha I have maybe is that I'm quite ambivalent towards the idea of offence. I don't get offended very often. If you do get very, very offended, then when you write, your sympathy is more with this character, whoever it is, and you're trying to abuse everybody else to highlight the grandeur of this <laughs> central character, who is usually you. Um, where, but I, um, <laughs> I, I don't... I don't find myself wanting to make a case for the meanness of me very much, mainly because I'm not quite sure what, what the meanness of me would be like. And, uh, but I think it's a complete delusion because I think I have no uh, qualities or personality or trait, like I'm some kind of master of negative capability, but I know lots of people who think I'm an arse or that I'm this or that, so I obviously have a strong personality, uh, the worst kind, where I think I don't have one. I think I'm just you know, sitting around observing, but actually I'm a real... Pain. But from, the, from, the, from white teeth on, your, your books lack, and I think one of the reasons they are so prized by critics and readers, the obvious authorial character. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it goes all the way through my life. You know, I can't write diaries, I can't bear long f to write in the first person at all. Um, Even fictionally. I did it once, I did it in a story for the New Yorker, but even that is kind of at a distance. It's a, that Gatsby position of being the friend or the, the person looking on at the main story. Um, so Nick Carraway you can do. Yeah, but I can't. I, I just, I don't know where to begin with that, I think. I don't, I can't do that. Okay, I'll put this, the next question in the third person for you. If, <laughs> if I ask you to fill in the blank in this sentence, Zadie Smith is a blank writer. What are the first and maybe the second sort of factual adjectives that you would stick in that blank? Um, I think I'm very willful. I think I'd probably like that in, as a person to very determined. That, that's the main quality I have, I think, just persistence more than anything else when I'm writing. I'm and, and does that lead you mostly to things you're happy with as a writer? Um, well... Yeah, I mean, I, I am, I, I'm happy-ish. I, a lot of it is in retrospect, you know. I guess I, that's the ambivalent <laughs> suffix, right? Yeah. Ish. Yeah. It depends, like, when I was ready, getting ready to do this, I get very nervous about doing things like this, and I would get very convinced that I'm not, like, it, as if it were a viva, that I'm not going to be smart enough, and so I go back and read over previous smart things that I've written in the past, and then it always seems like, who was the person who, who was smart enough to write that piece? I read this piece about Kafka that I wrote, I don't ever remember having those ideas or <laughs> being that smart, but it, it must have happened at some point. So it's always a feeling of falling off or something that you were able to do or you understood for a while and then 
promptly forgot everything that was in it or, or, <laughs> or that was serious. College is like that, you know, you're never as smart as you were when you were 19 in a seminar. It just disappears. <laughs> well, and you're never quite as convinced that you are smart as you are at 19. Yeah, I mean, it, there is, I, maybe it's, I think it's probably quite true of, of women in general, maybe it's a bad generalization, they tend to think they don't know what they probably do know, whereas some boys tend to go err in the other direction, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, I do have that. I, it takes a while to, to convince myself that I did know it and it wasn't foolish, or that I didn't plagiarize it. I always think that, well, that wasn't me, or somebody else must have done it. Or, that's, that's a very uh, constant feeling. Um, speaking, speaking of Kafka, um, and your in, indeed very smart piece about him, uh, in which you <laughs> talked about him doing this, why he wasn't a novelist, that he was trying to do this impossible, uh, inherently impossible thing that maybe all artists are doing. But I read also that you are writing with your husband a musical about Franz Kafka. Yeah, we were, this is one of our constant... See, they laughed, as, as yeah. I expected, <laughs> like springtime for Hitler. Yeah, <laughs> I hope it won't be that funny. I was thinking more yeah, um, the kind of... Kurt Viley type thing, but I, we've done no work on it, mainly because I've done very little work on it, but I, I do hope, it would be a great for me to mix two extreme pleasures in my life of fiction and musicals. Um, you, you, you talk about, uh, well, you, when I tally, try to tally the various people, writers you've mentioned in various interviews and various times in, in, in your writing of, that have been your heroes literarily or, or influences, you mentioned uh, C.S. Lewis, Ian Forster, Nabokov, Dickens, Raymond Carver, Updike. Updike is alive, but the rest are dead white males, and I wonder if you draw conclusions from that. Um, I don't have that thing. I was thinking about this recently of, of reading this essay and writing about those uh, three qualities of persuasion that Aristotle talks about, logos. Um, and I was thinking about ethos particularly, and the idea of being the the right person to speak, having the right to speak. And I, I notice certainly with a lot of young American white males that they feel very guilty about those kind of um, interests, those writers, those writers being their interests, so they feel they need to defend it. And I never felt the need to defend books that I liked. It didn't even occur to me. But now people do say dead white males, that kind of thing, and it seems strange to have a lot of interest in those writers. I, d I don't think that I'm... Uh, you know, I just, whatever is the best writing, as far as I can tell and feel, that's, that's what I'm interested in. Um, and it, it does, it stretches to lots of other writers too, but I, I had a very traditional education, so those writers came up more often than others. But now I, particularly when it comes to women's writing, I seek it out a lot more, I read it a lot more actively, because it's, uh, it's, it does become a matter of survival. You do need to know that there are women who wrote really well. And one way or another, even though I suppose role models are a silly idea, it can't help but make you feel better. When I, when I first read Virginia Woolf, I felt pleasure that she was a genius, but also great relief that she was a genius, because she was a woman. Uh, speaking of, of the realm of, of identity politics as a template put over, put over literature, when I, when I googled Zadie Smith and post-colonial, I got 23,000 returns, <laughs> and, and I'm wondering, uh, I, I, uh, I wonder what you think of that phrase and the concept and as applied to you and as a general academic rubric. I, I think it, it's, a, it's a factual description for a great deal of writing. I think you're, I mean, you're really pushing it with me. I mean, I'm born and bred in England, um, and I'm about as post-colonial post, post, post -colonial as it's possible <laughs> to be, I should think. Um, but, you know... I don't mean to sound cynical about it, but part of it is just convenience, and I, I kind of apologise to the rest of the post-colonial authors because they have a right to be there, and it just happens that White Teeth was published in the last year of the century, and it's, it's very neat. So you read a Rushdie, and, and you read the Qureshi, and then I'm just tucked in as, as the last minute goes on the clock. So that's oh, the, she has a Jamaican mother. That's the she, reason, she makes you know, it. And, that's, and that's nice, but I, I, I feel slightly um, disingenuous to be there, and I do notice quite often... And I'm touring, I'm meeting students, and they read white teeth, and they write, and then they have to write about the autograph, and that doesn't really fit in the whole post-colonial thing, and then it, it all gets lost. Um, but no writer should complain about books that are bought by students. You know, that's the, that's the thing that makes books survive. So any way that I'm in colleges is extraordinary for me. In in On Beauty, the the um, art historian, hero quasi hero of the book, Howard, is very much. Uh, uh, one could even say a caricature of the kind of deconstructivist, post-structuralist academic 
uh, theoretician. Um, did you go in, did you begin this book with, with what kind of attitude toward his kind of uh, work did you begin this book? You know, part of it is absolutely a caricature, and part of it is a self-caricature, because I was that person, you know, that was my whole deal when I was in college. Um, and again, it's, it's this thing about juggling this logos, ethos, pathos. Is, are you going to be, you know, do your work, is it going to be of knowledge? Is it going to be from your personhood? So you take me because I'm authentic, because I'm post-colonial. Or is it going to be this uh, emotional? And when I was in college, I had given myself completely to logos, and the rest of it could go hand. So how it is, how it is that man, really? And it was at the, I, you know, I realised later in a fairly predictable way that it was at the expense of all other parts of my life and my work, what was to become my work. Um, so it's affectionate, but also I really didn't want it to be um, anti-intellectual. Like it really gets me down when people go on their big hunt against postmodern theorists because some of that stuff is some of the greatest writing you'll ever read. There are essays by Derrida which. I would count uh, next to any novel that I love, and also by Barton, and by Foucault, and Levinas, and all of that stuff. That's I, I really don't mean to um, ridicule that because it's not to be ridiculed, certainly not by me. But just there, a certain kind of theory which calcifies and gets stuck, and becomes about careerism very much. I mean, that's inevitable. And if I'd stayed doing what I was doing, and if, if I'd gone on to become an academic, I would have got my little corner, I would have defended it against all comers, I would have intimidated my students. You know, I would have been that person absolutely. I was extremely fortunate to, to get out when I, when I did. But, um, yeah, and, and it seems to me you got out, one reason you got out is because you have the capacity to create moments of beauty, which people like um, Howard don't. Yeah, well, Howard doesn't, but then again I say, like, there's an essay, Structure, Sign and Play in the Human Sciences by Derrida, which is extraordinarily beautiful and intellectually sublime. So it's not that these people aren't artists. The best critics are as good as any artist, I think. But English studies has always had a problem, and it's been said many, many times, that when it was first introduced uh, in Cambridge by people like Levis, they needed to make a profession of it. They needed to make it serious. It had to look like math, it had to look like science. And to do that, they did some incredibly twisted things to it. And that was the problem. Because it's, it's quite hard to sit in the classroom and talk about love and uh, affective experience and, and the enjoyment that people get from novels without sounding like a load of kooks. And nobody wants to sound But it didn't used to. What changed? I mean, in 1960, say, that didn't sound kooky. In 1975, no. it did. I don't, I don't know. I, I have sympathy for it. Because when I did teach, I realized how difficult it was to make my students feel they were going through a rigorous experience, which is what they want. They get it in other parts of the campus. Um, I think the best way to do it personally, what I, I tried to end up doing when I was teaching the literary theory part of the class, was to bring everything to the table. So we have the novel, and we don't try and force it into a different shape to be something else, but we bring things to it to kind of kiss and greet. So you bring pieces of philosophy, and you bring pieces of history, and you bring things which seem to be relevant in the great circle of it, without smashing the book into some shape it just isn't going to go. So we try and keep respect for the novel, but add things on top rather than kind of denude it in some way. With the novel you're working on now, um, or imagining, or whatever moment in the process you are, do you have, beyond the, 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 your, what sounded like your slight dissatisfaction with being a 19th century realist, do you feel like, well, this, this multicultural celebration that I've specialized in as a subject, Enough for now, I'll, I'll let that lie fallow and try something else. Well, it's interesting, I, I read a bit of White Teeth again recently. There are lots of pieces in the papers about it was a great celebration of Monte Carlo. And I, not remembering what the hell was in the book, I thought, well, maybe I should check this out. And I had a look, and, and in fact, uh, it's quite, there's even a sentence quite the opposite, particularly um, Millat is in revenge against that very idea. He can't stand the idea of happy multicultural as, as he sees it, he thinks it's a nonsense. And there's always been a lie. And that's what sends him on his whole whole trajectory. So But the fact of the book and the takeaway of readers. The thing, but I, I think you have to really be be white or something to think that just showing people different colours together is like a, a statement of some kind. I just it's not a statement, it's just a, a reality. I mean, really, honest to God, just trying to show what I see on the subway every single day or in the street or in a restaurant or anywhere. But it is true that certainly when I, when I get back into universities and into literary life, I do walk into a room and I'm the only black girl a lot. But that's not normal. That's just the world of books and universities and, and 
posh fashion parties. It's not life. I mean, yes, it's but, not real. But, but the, 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 all the non-black girl characters in that novel and the others are not stick figures or shallow. No, I mean, I, try, I, I, I do want to try and, and bring as much uh, sympathy to everyone, but I guess the, the thing is I don't see the racial differences as, as the big difference. Um, and particularly in, in On Beauty, I, I'm really much more interested in the way people behave to each other. Uh, their, their personal ethics is the best way I can put it. So, uh, of course race is a difference, but it, it's a small difference. The world is much more split to cruel people <laughs> and kind people, or, or uh, generous people, people who, who hold things back. I, I think of it much more that way. Or as Salman Rushdie once said when he was under his fatwa, the world is divided between people who have a sense of humor and people who can take a joke and people who can't. Absolutely. <laughs> um, That's a great definition. Um, we would love to take questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, and I believe there are microphones being, being brought to you. And I will reiterate Paul's uh, plea for questions rather than statements. Hi. Um, okay. Um, I um, so my sense is that you uh, resist categorization, excuse my uh, pronunciation. So in terms of definition, um, if you do define yourself, would you place yourself under the category as a British writer or black British writer or not? Oh yeah, I don't, I don't actually have a problem with definition at all. Definitions are easy, it's just what you, what you draw for them. I absolutely think of myself as, a, as black in English, as a, as a citizen, very much English, um, and very, very much as an English writer. Um, and very, very much black. I didn't think that there was any kind of contradiction between the years. No, it's just what, it's a fact of what I am, so... But uh, willfulness have, comes ahead. Yeah, yeah, willfulness. I'm definitely willful first. Anna Wilson first, I should say. Covered completely? Yes, I am. Yes. Two or three times that you felt You're very talking <laughs> I'm not used to going out. <laughs> you said two or three times that you felt very guilty about your life. Is it because you're not spending your time trying to change the world and doing good political things, or, or what is it? That's one of them. That, that'll do. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's always, a, I've been reading this biography of uh, Joyce, the Elm biography, and just to, to watch a man with literally nothing, begging every day for two pounds from here or there, and with the children in tow, and traveling, and writing these extraordinary books. You know, that's a very extreme comparison, but uh, what's that American thing? There's a phrase you have, the more given, the more expected, or something? You always hear that here. You know, and that's a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic thing to say, and that's the way I feel about it, that I just don't do enough Mainly it's just, to be honest, I, I don't think of, of writers as, they can obviously, but I don't think it's a necessity of writers to make political stands or to be considered wise on those issues. I I'm certainly have no wisdom on any of those issues, so I, I don't feel that way. But I do think that by the nature of your profession, you should do your profession well. So I would like to be the best writer I can be with the freedoms I have, and that I don't feel I achieve always. That's me. Hi. Um, I'm just curious, when you first started writing, what was the most difficult aspect for you of writing, and how did you kind of work through that? Um, uh, I think the, the most difficult thing, I don't know if Kurt would agree, is just having the, the confidence to think that anybody cares. That's the main thing, isn't it? Just that, that who gave you the right to, to do anything at all? That's the thing. And then there's all kinds of... Uh, just technical difficulties, getting through the middle of a story, ending a book, trying to keep all the characters out of the realm of caricature, which is really genius when you can do it. It's almost never done, certainly never done by me. And just the, the work of it, it's a lot of everyday work, and it's a lot of overcoming self-disgust. I think self-disgust is a daily experience for a writer. Just at every level, this, it just seems horrible what you write. And to try and get over the horribleness is a big deal. Do you feel as though from, from White Teeth through Autograph Man to um, uh, On Beauty that you figured it out substantially better? Do you do it be more easily now, relatively speaking? 
there's definitely technical things that I, I really hope I do better, and I, I do, I feel I do them better. And the, there's a certain, I <laughs> say, to my husband, I read this part of White Teeth recently, it was a paragraph, I can't remember where it was, but I was so enamored of the sound of things. There are whole paragraphs that don't make human sense. It's really, <laughs> really extraordinary. So I hope that I would never speed on in that way that I used to write as if I were just singing or something and just carry on and, and not worry. And also, as you get older, you have a little more commitment to the truth, a little bit more sympathy, a less, uh, I don't know, there's a boldness that young people have, which is lovely and great. And I love to read first novels. I love to see someone just say, here I am, here's my stuff, screw you. That's what a first novel is. <laughs> but um, it's also a, a joy to read books and novels in their maturity. Which I, you know, I'm still, I'm 30, so I think I have a long way to go, but I like personally to read books by older people as well. Hey. Hi. Um, I wanted to know, in more in the autograph man and white teeth, it seems like you write about male friendships. And is that easier for you to do than writing about female friendships? Or why, what is that, um, if it is to do that? I, uh, I have a li little suspicion in my head that, that if I do ever write a really great book, it would be because I've figured out more about women and how they relate to each other. And if I could do that, I think it would be a really good application of skill to a, to a subject which is genuinely difficult. And uh, w when I was growing up, uh, I, I'm much, I suppose my friends are many more male friends than female. And particularly when I became an adolescent, I I've, I've was completely horrified by female life, I think, and, and the thing of being a girl and, and everything about it just seemed to me a great uh, disaster, a personal <laughs> disaster for me. Um, but now as I get older, I, I'm i getting better and I, I still have, I think I have difficulties um, with women in a certain way because they're so... Um, as characters. As characters and as people because they're so, they keep so much under the surface. Mm -hmm. and, and men, it's an old cliche, but men are much more out there, they speak much more frankly, they don't seem to have these levels of disguise which are absolutely necessary to survive as a, as a woman in the West, you need to do these things. But um, that's why, it was easy for me, more familiar, and I also find male friendship very, very touching when it's, when it's genuine, because it seems to me very, uh, very direct and very much about just a genuine companion. But women friendships, as anyone in the room knows, have deep complexities and and dark holes. <laughs> As opposed to the simple-minded male friendships. Oh, that's yeah. right. I, do, I guess I do think that way. It's yeah. my prejudice. It's true. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about the title. The question is how, how you chose the title White Teeth. I think that's the question I get asked most often, and I, I must be not giving satisfactory answers, but um, the answer is quite boring. The only... The, reason I can think of, I always used it, it was always the title, I never thought twice about it, but uh, after it came out, my mother suggested there's a kind of joke in England, you can only see black people in their dark from their white teeth, it's kind of an old 1970s, 70s joke I used to hear as a kid, so I think that's probably it. But on a much more conscious level, it, there's a series of incredibly laboured metaphors about teeth and roots and stuff in the book, so that was the actual conscious reason. Were you... Were you, you, you Make every book you ever write have two words in the title. <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm very fussy about titles. I think of them at once. They never change. And I'm always amazed people are writing and they're choosing between titles. They don't choose till the end, or the editor chooses it. I, that's amazing to me. I'm. I'm very set on even the typeface of the title. <laughs> What's the next novel called? I haven't decided. Yet. <laughs> I have started writing oh. it though. It's still. It's just murmurings in my head at the moment. Why did you create Kiki as a large woman? Um, you see, it's another it's thing of, kind of, kind of why we're, as a positive choice. I mean, I th obviously it was a book about beauty. I myself was a pretty big girl when I was a kid, so obviously it's a thing that I think about uh, and um, experience. And also, if you've ever had a big physical change from being very big to very small or, or vice versa, um, you understand what these things mean in the world and how extraordinary it is to pass through the world as one physical person and then as another all those books about men, women dressing as men or a black person whiting up and all those things. Sometimes they're not that interesting, those books, but to live the experience, if you can manage it, is, is quite striking. So I wanted to, to write about that and the feeling of, of carrying a body like that around. 
And also, I suppose I wanted to make a point, which isn't that disguised in the book, that it's, it's often said, but I do think it's true that in the, the black community, like in my mother's community, Jamaican community, there's a lot of, of beauty and bigness as well. I, sometimes I felt bad when I was big, I did, but a lot of the time I didn't. And also in my life, in terms of all the things that bigness is meant to keep you from, is no different. You know, the same amount of love as you have the same life, and nothing really changes except this culture which is screaming at you that you're all wrong. Um, so I, I wanted to write about the kind of beauty of that kind of physicality as well. It can be really hot. Did, did, when, when, when White Teeth came out and it was said again and again and again in the coverage of it, even in reviews of it, like, oh, it's a great book, but she, she got published because she's so pretty, because she's so beautiful. Did that strike you as though you'd suddenly taken off your glasses and having not yeah. felt yourself so beautiful it, work? It was, you know, incredible irony, absolutely, given my childhood, but... I used to be really uh, like shy away from a question like that and be really oh well and actually now I'm older I'm really I'm really angry about it it's really irritating and I work really hard to write my book and I work really hard to get through college and it's just a real it's just outrageous <laughs> to be yeah. told after all that that oh you just it was because you put your photo on the manuscript that was a story you used to go around London complete <laughs> untruth and in fact it's just a nasty piece of sexist nonsense yeah. well, that's one and adding the race to it as well it's just unpleasant. Sure. Uh, given the imminent collaboration on Metamorphosis, the musical, <laughs> uh, Kurt Vilish, though it may be, I'm wondering if you're a fan of Mel Brooks, and if so, what your favorite films are. You know, if I could get a ticket to that show, then I would be a fan of but I've never got a ticket to the producers in London or New York, so I, I'm, I can't be a fan of that show, but I, I am a fan of Mel Brooks, actually. Um, I, I like uh, comic films maybe almost as much as musicals. I like, I, we were having a conversation recently at a dinner party where people were bringing up all these incredibly sophisticated Italian and French films, and uh, I, I have no experience in that area. Um, <laughs> uh, what do I like? It's just, it's just the music that I love. I, I have quite two separate areas of taste. I really like 40 show tunes and I really like gangster rap. <laughs> I don't know how that came to be. Um, I really don't think of it as gangster rap, so whenever I uh, read those articles kind of just so aggressive towards it and then somebody defends it, or I never get involved in that, because to me the music is so, it's so beautiful. So I, that whole argument is kind of to the side, I don't really, I know that people are arguing about the representation of women, and, but what I see in it is a bit like, um, you know like in epic poetry where they have a boast, some will boast about the size of the army, or I think of rap like that, so a lot of the things that people find offensive I don't even register, I just think that's the boast, it's what you do to get to there, and then you do the song, so I don't, I don't notice that stuff. And there are certain things like uh, the, the biggie video to Mo Money, Mo Problems, or they just seem to me ecstatic, they're, like, they're so joyful that you can't help but be delighted to, to hear them. So part of it is just, I find it joyful, and the wordplay is extraordinary in the, in the best rappers, they're just beyond belief. So I guess when Jay-Z did A Hard Knock Life, which was a pseudo-40s No, I hated that. Oh, it was awful. No, that was too much of a good thing. I really liked Jay-Z. I love that. Ma'am, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, who or what was the inspiration for the character of Levi? Someone yeah, no, that's an easy question because it's my little brother. and I. Who is the son of Howard. Yeah. And, uh, that, would, that would never be true of many other characters, but that's a very direct uh, uh, picture of my little brother, who unfortunately, like Levi, will never read a book. So, <laughs> But I told him about it, and he's heard bits of it, because I read a bit out loud to him. Uh, we were in a bookshop, he heard me read a bit. He said to me, you should let me do the accent. He said, terrible, let me do the accent. <laughs> uh, but uh, he always he's English, so there's a difference there. But um, th I think there's a, a lot of my Luke in Levi not only in his interest and in his interest in hip hop and in his interest in the idea of being of the street, but also uh, my little brother is quite, I think anyway, quite innocent in a, in a very enjoyable way and very, um, I don't know, just a very direct way of relating to the world. And once you become educated or over educated, you feel nostalgia for, I suppose, what I see as Luke's kind of immediate relation to the world. That's a very nostalgic thing, but I do think that. One time for one more question. Ma'am, back here. I wanted to respond to your statement about um, gangster rap. Um, I, I understand that England is becoming a much more violent society as 
Um, don't you feel some responsibility as a writer or even as a citizen I, to speak to that? You're, you're absolutely right. England is getting more violent. And I, I don't know how responsible to... See, the thing is, I think of rap as an expression of that violence. I don't think of it as the instigator. Um, though, of course, in every medium, a kid will watch Halloween and they go, you know, there will always be those relations. But I think that kind of communication is quite rare. And I just don't really understand why you can have kind of hard-boiled literature or, or main, uh, serious literary um, fiction like American Psycho, which deals with uh, urban horror. And then in hip-hop, it's always taken to be almost like it's, it's politics, like it's someone speaking in the first person and directing people to behavior. I think of hip-hop as, as narrative. I, I always have. Although isn't the difference, I mean, to, one could argue between American Psycho, say, and hip-hop is the order of magnitude of impressionable people that it can affect? Uh, absolutely. The, I, I can't. See, this is the reason why I never write op-ed pieces defending <laughs> rap, because I absolutely know I couldn't, and, it, and I'd be given all this evidence um, in the country, but I just know that within the community, people who listen to hip-hop, the understanding is quite different from, from the piece you read in the New York Times. It just doesn't... It's not the same thing at all. They're not hearing the same words. It's not the same. There's a fondness for some of these songs. They're the songs which will make you weep. There's two pack. Or if you can pick up any Tupac song telling you the most terrible <coughs> things, and then you can also hear Brenda's Got a Baby or Changes, all these like kind of gospel songs of what they are. So I think of rappers are people who are not consistent. They're completely inconsistent. They'll write in incredibly radical songs about change and transformation, and they'll write the stupid song about the bitches and the hoes. And they're like that. That's they're what willful. They do. They're willful. <laughs> but I kind of I, I try and keep the best of it and love it for that. Uh, I want to thank Sadie Smith. <laughs>